Okay, can you hear me now? Perfect. Can you okay, hear me okay? Me, yeah, let me get rid of the matzah background. That was from a virtual Seder. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good, though. It is pretty good. Uh, let's see. Choose virtual background. Uh, none. There we go. That's a, that's a little better. Go. Great. Yeah, perfect. Cool. So we're tr- we'll try out a new format here. We'll see how this works. So if I cut okay. out or anything, you know, let me know. I, I'm I'm just getting used to this um, the interface into the Zoom situation, but it should work yep. all right. <laughs> Sounds good from here, anyway. Good. Now, well, good to see you. I'm glad that you've escaped the 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 cold grip of death. Yeah, it was. Uh, I don't know if I, I, you know, death might have had had me by one toe there for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> there, <laughs> there was a there was a about a 24 hour period where I kept where I was like close to having to go to the ER and. Of course, with what you hear about hospitalization these days, that's not something you want to. Boy, yeah, you try not do. to do it. Yeah, that's yeah. my thinking too. I'm in New York. If you know, if I start to yeah. get sick, I'm going to try to hightail it back to Boston because I don't know. <laughs> out here, it might get a little wild. You know, well, it's getting pretty hot up here too. It's, yeah, uh, we're, 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 I mean, no, nobody's nobody's as hot as as, as New York City or right my state, but Boston, uh, Massachusetts is catching up. Sure. Yeah. Do you know if you had coronavirus or was it just a? It could have been anything. I wasn't tested. Sure. Uh, yeah, a, 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 tested. a phrase you heard probably. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Words. Yeah. Uh, but the, but the, because based on the symptoms, my doctor and all of the follow up uh, telephone nursing and stuff, they kind of eventually assumed that that's what I had because it wasn't acting like any kind of normal flu. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Sure. But I guess you well, you beat it out back to, back to I, whatever. I guess life. so. We'll have to see if there's immunity or, and, uh, um, right. Yeah. Oh, there's so many questions around it. I'm not about to go sort of like, you know, traipsing out, you know. <laughs> sure. People. Yeah. You don't want to. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, yeah. Well, new world. Right, well, you know, thanks for doing this. Appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Trying out the new format. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, before we get into the music thing, you, uh, you followed a, a similar path th- that I did and that you started off in uh, the world of philosophy before you <laughs> made the leap into, into the lucrative jazz career. Yes. Uh, what was it that brought you into <laughs> philosophy? And then how did you transition from that into being a professional musician? Well, uh, before I was even, I was a philosophy major in college and um, you're at Harvard, uh, right? Yep. And before that, when I was in high school and junior high school, I was really into journalism um, I was uh, the editor of the school paper, and and uh, you know this was like I was born in '59, so you can imagine this was like the height of Watergate and Woodward and Bernstein and the whole sort of uh, the press being you know seen as a, a savior of our country, and and uh, so I did in high school. I was really into that, and, but I, I I got the jazz bug while I was in high school. Um, I always played instruments and I got the jazz bug big time and I started slipping into the school paper more and more strange articles about, you know, my, about music and stuff. And, and by the end of high school, I was off the school paper. I got thrown off and I had my own underground newspaper (laughs) 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 and we used to write about Sun Ra and, and, and stuff. So I had the jazz, you know, the severe jazz interest going by then and, but also, uh, I had a really cool music uh, music uh, English teacher mm. in high school, um, Lou Barrett, uh, Louisa, I guess, whose son is a fine musician in New York, really great cello player, um, who uh, who helped me to like Franz Kafka and um, Kierkegaard and you know a lot of philosophical literature, and I think that got me my little my poor little pointed head spinning around those kind of questions, and then. When I got to college, you know, I had a year to decide my major, and it seemed like uh, thinking about the deep, the deep thoughts of like, you know, you know, the, the basic philosophical thoughts. How do we know what we know? What you know, what's right, what's wrong? You know, seemed to really um, be interesting to me, and so that's what I did. Sure, that that must have been a fascinating time to be there too, because a lot of the people that, if I remember right, the people who were teaching there when you were there were the people that I was studying later on. I mean, it's like. You know John Rawls and Robert Nozick and Quine. Yeah. I think wasn't yeah. he? Again? Oh yeah, it was. Uh, they were all there. It was like, um, yeah, it was. It was a real all star department. And um, in fact, I've, I've got a good Quine story for you. This oh, good. Time, uh, you know, 
Quine, for those of you out there, which is like 99.9% yeah, of everybody, was considered America's greatest philosopher within academic circles. Not a popular, not, not a popularizer, but as a deep thinker uh, from probably the you know, 50s through the 70s, 80s. Um, this would be about 77, 78, somewhere in there. Um, I was in a, a philosophy seminar discussing one of his key essays, Epistemo Epistemology Naturalized, it was called this like 12 or 15 page essay that really was important. And we, we'd been talking about it for hours with this other professor who was also a venerable guy. And, and we're like trying to figure out what does this one sentence mean? You know, if you've ever been in a, you know, like a, a college seminar, you know, you get stuck on these like tiny little things, especially philosophy. And uh, after two hours, we all got up. We, we came out of the professor's office where the seminar was and he shared a vestibule with the quine. We walked out and there was Quine himself standing there. <laughs> he was semi-retired at the time. He's pretty old. And he was trying to lock the door to his office. And he's there with his key. And he's got a little tremble in his hand, maybe. And he can't quite get the key to go into the, the keyhole. And we're all, this is like eight or nine of us had been deep inside of his head. We're all watching in just incredible horror and fascination as, as Quine cannot lock his own office. Yeah. Uh, and he eventually did. And, but so yeah, that's that, kind of wild, though. That's a transition was, to go right back and forth. You know. It was kind. Of, it was kind of wild. I guess it would be like studying philosophy at Harvard at at that point would be like studying, you know, at New England Conservatory or or studying jazz or at the New School or something where, you know, the next person that walks by could be one of the one of the legends. You know. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So how did so you is that how you ended up in Boston? Is going to Harvard? Yeah. Where'd yeah, you sure. start out? Uh, I started out in Queens, New York. Okay. And uh, we moved out of there when I was about, my, my, my parents had a mixed marriage. She was, my mom was from Brooklyn. My dad is from Manhattan. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we moved to Connecticut when I was about three or so, um, about an hour from New York. My dad commuted to New York. He was an, a madman. And uh -huh. um, I grew up in, in Westport, Connecticut, uh, all through my high school. And then, then I moved up here when I was 17, 17 18. Sure. And I, I thought I'd be here for four years and here I am and it's 44 years now. Yeah, pretty good. So you, how did you get then from, you, you graduated from Harvard and you said, now I'm going to be a saxophone player. <laughs> kind of, yeah. Well, when I got, I was, I just started playing sax uh, senior year of high school. I would played violin before and piano. So I had a musical education, mm -hmm. but um, I found this like cabal of slightly older guys in my town who were really into the same jazz that I was, which was, you know, Coltrane and Ornette Coleman and Sam Rivers and, you know, uh, all of that intense post-bop stuff that was going on in New York in the 70s. And, and uh, I found this little group and these guys had been playing for years. Like, I mean, you know, they were probably 19 years old. They'd been mostly been playing since they were kids, like 10. So they were pretty mm -hmm. advanced players. They'd studied with uh, the bass player, had studied with Dave Holland and, and um, they liked me. And uh, they knew that I had listened to a lot of music. So they basically stuck a horn in my face and said, start playing. <laughs> so I, I kind of jumped into the deep end of the pool. Like before I really had worked through a lot of technical stuff at all, I was playing, you know, improvisational, free improvisational or swinging improvisational stuff with some pretty advanced players. Um, I guess the most prominent among them now would be uh, John Mulcairn, who's a trumpet player who uh, has been a member of Defunct for, you know, on and off since about 1980. And it played with a lot of other people in that, that world. Um, okay. Uh, the other guy seemed, one of them, the drummer, Rob Reynolds, is no longer on planet Earth. And the bass player seems to have uh, left uh, music. But in any case, I'm, 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 I'm getting diverted here. I, I, I was lucky enough to jump in headfirst into an intense experience of jazz and then i when i got to college i had to start working my way backwards and working on technique and working on scales and figuring out what the hell i was doing and um, this was the late 70s so it was like kind of the punk rock era mm -hmm. and rock and roll suddenly became intellectually respectable you know among the fringe intellectual class <laughs> and sure. so some friends of mine and i one night were um I would say, um, let's just say we had been, had an encounter with uh, Mr. Mescalito and we were standing <laughs> on a street corner and one of them said, everybody was a musician, but n n we were all sort of interested in different genres. And one guy 
said, um, who was a piano player, said to me, can you play the blues? I said, yeah, I think so. And said to the, the bass player, who was sort of a country and rock and roll guy, I said, can you play blues? He said, I think so. Guitar player, another rock guy, can you play blues? I think so. You know, so he said, well, okay, we're not just standing on a street corner now. We're a blues band. And <laughs> <laughs> so we started playing, you know, blues and boogie woogie and then transitioned into like blues rock and and 60s garage rock and 50s rock and r&b and you know it started really edu- that was a big education for me so the, each of the other people in the band had some experience even a lot of experience in in these various genres but that band was a real real like a uh, training ground in like basic american music sure um, we 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 had we we were jazzy, but we weren't jazz per se. And uh, then we started writing original tunes, which, under the influence of that era, came out more like new wave, you know, punk. Mm-hmm. Um, but we all had all those other elements. We were like a rootsier kind of kind of rootsier version. We weren't like a hardcore guitar punk band or or like a totally stiff like no knee joints new wave band. We we had a, a little more of the American funk in our in our sound. Sure. It and, sounds like you're, you're, you just dove in at every turn. It, was there a point where you took lessons or it was just... Yeah. yeah. And, Dur- during college, I started taking... I took some lessons. Um, did I take lessons during college? Yeah, I did. I did. Uh, um, the the uh, John Payne Music School in, in, in Brookline. Okay. Uh, took some lessons there. And then, uh, then I got out of college in 82 and I joined another different rock band that was a pretty big deal around Boston. And we, we had, we thought we were going to get, you know, the big record contract and get the brass ring. And so I did that for a couple of years and that was kind of a full-time endeavor. And we were gigging a lot and traveling a little bit and recording and just being a band and, you know, and then at the end of that in 84, um, I kind of realized that as a saxophone player and as a, someone who's, with a big love for jazz, I needed to I needed to know a lot more about music, you know, technique and theory and everything. Sure. And so I went to Berkeley for a year. Okay. I just I you know I, I already had my degree, so I didn't really. I just wanted to learn stuff, and Berkeley was really cheap then. It was before they had their teacher strike, and mm-hmm. got a fa- I got a fair deal for all those teachers. It was really an insanely good deal for us, you know, students at that point. And so I did three semesters at Berkeley. That's why I really got to study learn theory, work on my technique, you know, just all of that technical foundation. Sure. Who'd, who'd you study with? Saxophone, I studied with Andy McGee uh, and Bill Pierce. Um, I also studied outside of Berkeley with Bob Mover. Okay. And Jerry, Ber- Jerry Berganzi. Mm-hmm. And uh, my favorite classroom teachers at Berkeley, Ken Polig, who was a Mingus specialist, among other things. Cool. And uh, I had some great ensemble teachers, Donald Brown, um, um, Fred Lipsius from Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Okay. Uh, you know, just, I mean, some real, real top pro, you know, great musicians who were very encouraging and kind of, I think, saw where I was at. You know, they realized, like, I was still trying to shore up my technical basis, but they could see that I had uh, um, listened a lot and had had ideas, and they were very encouraging. I, 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 enjoyed, I thought that was a great year. Sure. It's see that's a that was a it's kind of a great era to be in Boston too. There's a lot of musicians that were uh that were there at that time. It's true. Both well, between you know, Berkeley and yeah. NEC, you know. Yeah, no but my I mean my, my crop of people my age who 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 were Berkeley and NEC have really gone on to be, you know. But on the other hand, I think you could probably in ten years you'll be able to look at the people who were there in the nineties and it'll probably be the same kind of thing. Maybe I mean it could be yeah because it's such a you know Berkeley is such a magnet for talent and uh, NEC is such a magnet for really really top talent uh, that that you know you, it's just a funnel through which uh, I think um, many people are going yeah now is there what was it that did you think about st- st- staying in Boston or what your trajectory was going to be or did it just that you were there and it was, you know, you got used to it. So you stuck around. I mean, I, yeah. I think this is really a unique scene in Boston and growing up around there, I was happy to get to check out bands like, you know, what you were doing with the either orchestra or the fringe, or there's a, there's a really inside outside, super creative, not maybe academic, but kind of, I think the academic meets punk rock thing in Boston. That was really, <laughs> yeah. uh, 
you know, that was inspiring to me, but uh, was there yeah. something that kept you in town or was it? You know, it's an, that's an interesting question. Um, I think part of it was uh, that I'd grown up around New York and had gotten really a major league dose of New York jazz scene from 75 on when I first really started going, getting on the, the, the train and going to New York and going to jazz concerts. Um, I mean, I, I heard, you know, you name it, you, you name it, who was alive in jazz in the 70s. I heard him play in New York. And um, uh, so, uh, you know, I never, I didn't have that. I, 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 I felt like I had gotten like an education, if not a playing education, of, like a listening education in, in what was happening in New York. So I don't think I felt maybe as compelled to head there, head back there as some people who had never had the New York experience. Of course, I didn't have it as a player. But I also think that in 82 or 83, 84, you know, when I was fresh out of college, when a lot of people will take off and go to New York, I, I, didn't, I don't think I was nearly strong enough player, um, you know, or I didn't feel that way at the time. You know, maybe it would have been a different experience if I had gone there and just, you know, done my shedding there. Sure. But, uh, and then, and also because I was in, by the time I was out of college in 82, I was already had been in a couple of working bands. I was kind of part of a scene here. And, and, um, uh, and you know, by the time I got out, out of my year at Berkeley at 85, I had sort of created a scene on top of a scene with like other players who were at Berkeley and then my rock friends. And, you know, so, yeah, I felt, I, I guess I was pretty ensconced by then. And I just never, um, never, uh, had that moment to jump. Sure. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm actually, I'm glad you didn't. So I could, I could <laughs> see what you're doing, you know, back in the day. Um, now, how did you then get, what was the name of the band that you were in, that you were working with most often? Well, the two rock bands that were the most, the first one, the college one, um, which was called the decoders, which we were named, we named ourselves the decoders before we heard, we, before Ronald Shannon Jackson, um, we came up with the decoding society at least before they became well known. So we were, we were sort of on a, I think we were thinking about some similar things from a, maybe a different musical perspective. Sure. Um, and then the band after that, that that was real popular around New England that was potential rock stars was called the Sex, sex Execs. Okay. <laughs> pretty Which, good. And we were a pretty big deal eighty three, eighty four in Boston. We almost won the Rock and Roll Rumble back when it was important. We lost to Till Tuesday. We okay. beat the we beat the Del Fuegos. You know, it's all kind of hilarious, like ancient history now. But uh, we were pretty yeah. popular, and people finally remember the band. It was it was a large group. It was an eight piece group with three horns in it, and um, and it was sort of a power pop, um, you know, group at a time when Boston was really full of like guitar rock. Sure. So how how did you then? Where, where did the either orchestra come in? Well, either orchestra came in because I was finishing up my third semester at Berkeley, which was summer of 85, summer of 85. And um, I was kind of running out of money, as inexpensive as it was. I was paying for it myself. As inexpensive as it was, I was running out of money. And But I was just starting to get a handle on being able to write scores that made that sounded kind of like what I wanted them to when people played them. Sure. <laughs> so you, you know the feeling, right? Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you go through that, like, feeling your way around where you write stuff and Go, and they play it and they go, you go, hmm, that's not what I was thinking. But I was starting to get a handle on it. Mm -hmm. And um, I had also been going to New York, you know, regularly all through these years. And I was enamored of Gil Evans' Monday Night Sweet Basil Big Band. Yeah. Which was um, just a, an incredible organization, you know. And it had um, these, these sprawling kind of rock and funk oriented rhythm sections, sometimes with two or three keyboards, guitar, Hiram Bullock often different bass players, you know, different drummers. Um, and then, of course, this really r amazingly rock-solid horn section with Lou Soloff playing lead and um, uh, uh, and saxophone players like George Adams and Howard Johnson in there. Mm -hmm. And this, this really great uh, English guy, um, Chris something rather, who played alto, was sort of Sanborn, Sanborn esque And Gil sitting there hunched over his Rhodes piano in the front and I love the freedom of that band, like the way the rhythm section and the soloist could reshape the music, even though there were these like very uh, involved orchestrated parts too. the way yeah. that that all fit together. So I was, I was really into that. Mm -hmm. I, um, and um, 
I also always loved Sun Ra. That was always my favorite favorite big band going back to the mid seventies. Sure. And um, but I was starting to get my score writing together, and I thought, shoot, I'm out of money now. There's no more project bands. Let me just get together a Monday night band. And I, I was living in this really rundown but cheap house in Cambridge that had a big room in it. So I started. So I said, I'm going to write some charts. I'm going to get some of my people to come big. And so I got some Berkeley cats. Um, some people I knew from the rock world, you know, uh, a Harvard buddy who played piano, um, uh, and just started doing these Monday night rehearsals and people were enjoying it. And I always, you know, made sure there's plenty of beer, which was, you know, enough to hire musicians. Yeah. Right. 20, 25 year old musicians at that point. And, um, after a few months we got a gig, uh, or I realized we need a gig to keep, to keep our focus. And we got a gig, a free gig. And we played it in December of 85. And it just sort of one step, was one step after another. Then we started playing at clubs. And then uh, I said, well, shoot, let's record. I, you know, recorded with, with these rock bands I had been in before. I was like, shoot, we can do it with this. So we, we, we you know, uh, we recorded an album worth of material or more in the studio and live. And I put out, you know, I put out that album in 80, in, that was recorded in 86. The album came out in 87. And I just started collecting information. I was just kind of like a man on a, a mission. You know, I just didn't have, there was nothing that I couldn't, nothing was stopping me, which is the, the good thing about being 25 or 26 yeah, or sure, years old, yeah. you know, nothing could stop you. And, and I was lucky to have a lot of good things go my way. I had this cheap, very cheap rent controlled house for rehearsals and to live in. Um, I had had experience uh, as a radio DJ in college, so I knew how how radio worked. So I was able to get our record on the radio um, all across the country, uh, the first LP. And mm-hmm. um, I, you know, because from my journalistic writing experience, I was able to like generate pretty good publicity material. So I was able to be a kind of a one man operation, one man little music company with these various skills that I had put in my pocket over the years. Sure. And, um, and, um, and then somewhere around 87, Tom Halter, who was been playing trumpet in the band since the beginning said, let's go on tour, you know, like, Oh, okay. Let's take an 11 piece band on tour. Sure. Ridiculous yeah. idea. Okay. Let's do it. And, um, so I sent everybody home this, we were still young enough. So people were going home for Christmas and stuff. And I, I sent everybody home. I said, okay, find find a, a place to play in your hometown. There were a lot of Midwesterners in the band. Mm-hmm. And so they came back with information. This is before the internet, so it was harder to find. find sure, yeah. Stuff. And um, people came back with like, okay, I got a club in my town. I got a club in my town. I got a club in my town. And um, and then the missing element, or the, the last element, was the Boston Globe covered me and my rhythm section, not the whole band, playing at a party. We were playing some kind of fundraiser party and... Uh, this uh, journalist from the Globe, who wasn't a music writer, but was like a consumer page writer, she wrote a page in the um, in the Boston in the, the Sunday Magazine. She uh, she she wrote us up as a great party band, even though that wasn't really our intent. Although we liked playing party music, sure. And uh, the phone started ringing, and I got like forty thousand dollars worth of wedding and party gigs <laughs> off of this thing. And so I said to the guys in the band, "Listen, we're going to be playing all these wedding and party gigs, which isn't exactly what we're our mission is, right?" Sure, but let's say let's save let's save money, and we can afford to tour off of it. Interesting. You know, we can have a, a tour fund, so we had a tour fund saved up that got us through our first three tours before we started really, bur- you know, breaking even. And when I say breaking even, I mean paying all the musicians. Not very much, but I, I was considered that you had to pay the musicians. You know, yeah, that, it just seemed like you had to. And I figured out after one night where we crammed in twelve people into three hotel rooms, I figured out. You need to get one bed per person. <laughs> yeah, that's a big help. Yeah. No cots, no doubling, no nothing. And those were the two keys to our early touring was no more than two people per room and tour fund. And uh, so we started touring around the Midwest. This was 88, 89. And, uh, and uh, we had a follow-up album and um, just developing a fan base out there. And nobody was doing, like jazz groups weren't doing that. We were kind of more following the punk rock, like van aesthetic at that time. Sure, yeah. Even now it's it's rare. I mean, people will yeah. you know, fly places and do things, but the, but in rock 
funk, whatever world, everybody's on the road all the time. And in jazz world, yeah. it's kind of a funny thing. You got to really, you got to really convince them to go someplace sometimes. Well, jazz that's, players, yeah. That's tough with 11 people though, traveling around. I mean, would you have a van and. Yeah, I bought a van. Um, I guess maybe, I can't remember if we rented the first. I bought a minivan and we rented a big 15 passenger van. And then uh, the next tour, I think I bought a big van too. So I owned two vans there for for years, like a big fifteen passenger lunker, sure, and a, and a minivan, and um, and uh, yeah, we just uh, we, we you know uh, except for the fact that we were playing jazz, we were behaving exactly like an indie rock band, you know, down to the smoke, you know, pouring out of the, d- the windows of the van, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and um, and there was that first touring band was an un- incredible array of talent i mean it was the rhythm section was jerry dupree jerome dupree later of morphine mm-hmm. mike Rivard, club delf uh john dirac a legendary great guitar player john medeski that was a rhythm section mm-hmm. yeah, you know the, the horn section was like john carlson tom halter uh you know doug yates charlie colhase curtis hasselbring R- russell jewell i mean it was just when i think about the talent that i had driving around the country and eat they were, everybody's getting paid two two hundred and fifty dollars a week you know sure it's but it's, at that time you want to do it you want to go on yeah adventure. they didn't have anything better to do and it was a great adventure and the the biggest thing was that the music came alive in a way that it could never happen here at home and that was part of my jazz uh, his, historian side was like when i was examining like what i thought was was because I was I loved the you know the the swing the swing bands you know going all the way back I was always really aware of the stuff in the 30s 40s and you know when I studied them I was like these guys play like they play this shit every day which was true yeah they, they don't play like they have music in front of them and so that my just I figured that the, to get the either orchestra to sound if not like that to have that kind of integrity you had to try to recreate the work conditions. Yeah, know? sure. And that, that was that was the goal. And everybody in the band really got that really quickly, that that if we went out and played for two or three weeks in a row, the music was, you know, 10 times as good at the end. Like yeah. They were willing to sacrifice their crappy jobs in Xerox stores and, and whatnot to, uh, to, uh, to participate in that. Sure. And there's no substitute for that. I mean, you, you listen to the Ellington band in the 50s or – those guys played like 360 nights a year, <laughs> some kind of wild thing like that. And they could play anything. I mean, it's an amazing, it's an amazing. Yeah. I mean, band. every, yeah, yeah. That, 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 that group think is, you know, and of course we admire the, the court, the, the small groups like Coltrane Quartet and the Miles is various quintets and mm-hmm. Mingus's bands and all that. And it's hard enough in, to keep a, four people together for a period of time. And, um, uh, to do it with that, with a, with ten, you know, with a core of ten or fifteen people, it it, it creates just a, a texture that you can't get any other way. Right, exactly. Yeah, but it's not easy to 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 put the work in, put them out on the road, and like you know, make no, it, it happen. But it's this almost is a impossible. Time. <laughs> Nowadays, exactly. but I think about that. It's kind of unfortunate that it is very difficult to maintain that consistent performance schedule. Yeah. And without it, it's it's hard to, you know, you, you can't get a band as tight as you want it to be unless you're playing all the time and playing different gigs. Well, it's it's a balance because, you know, the people that you would like to have in your band are great musicians, right? They're in demand. They've got their own projects going. They're in demand as sidemen from other people. They're playing and, you know, they're getting paid to play in shows or whatever. They, they got teaching, you know, uh, teaching jobs so there's all of this what's that centrifugal force sure on, on that quality of musicians you could put together a band of like musicians that aren't that good um and you'd have more of their attention uh you know it's a, it's a it's a balancing act i mean i've always just tried to get people that understood the project and and could make a statement had a personality when when you pointed to them and said take a solo they were going to like say something yeah, that's been, that's been my philosophy. Yeah, sure. So now let me go back a little bit. Where'd you come up with the format for the band? Were you thinking in terms of a little big band, or were you thinking in terms of the Gil Evans concept, or what was the the instrumentation good, process? You know where it really came from. Actually, um, it was originally seven horns. It was two bones, two trumpets, three saxes. Mm-hmm. And I played a recital my last semester at um, at Berkeley uh, of a, a pianist 
composer, arranger guy named Eduardo Souza, who's the younger brother or older brother, maybe, probably older brother of Luciana Souza, the great Brazilian singer. Mm-hmm. Eduardo was a very smart guy. I, I think their parents owned a recording studio, a really, a really major league one in Brazil when they were growing up. So he grew up in music and he, he wrote really interesting charts. And so I played on his recital. And um, when I was, uh, you know, probably just a month or two later when I was putting together the either orchestra, I asked him if he wanted to play. And I asked if I could use some of his charts. So we had a couple, so I borrowed some of his charts at the beginning. And that, that I like that seven horn format. Um, I guess it also, you know, uh, I've been a Birth of the Cool fan forever. Sure. And so I like that, that, that medium size, that six horns and different horns from either orchestra. But, right. Um, and I also felt like um, seven horns, you know, 11 people in the band, we had a four piece rhythm section then. That was small enough so everybody would be a, soloist would be a real significant soloist you know mm-hmm. you know how it is you probably you played in big bands you know if you're playing fourth chair trumpet or third chair trump whatever it is you yeah. know you, you you're not going to get a very big bite of the apple and so right. it's it's you have but i wanted people that want, were wanted in you know mm-hmm. they want, wanted into the action and so i figured that was about as big as as you could go it was also about as many people as i could fit in the rehearsal room too sure yeah it makes it, but it's enough that you can really you you can orchestrate it almost like a big band, and that you, you even can. you have sections and whatever. But that's right. You don't have to have all the extra people on hand. In the first in the first ten years, when we had two trombones, you really could because you had a section of each, and um, and uh, so yeah, it was like a, it was like a, it was like a stripped down big band. But mm-hmm. it also forced what I noticed. Uh, it forced you to do what Ellington would do a lot. He did it by choice which was, um, you know, cross-sectional um, combinations. Mm-hmm. You know, that's one of his hallmarks is finding interesting combinations of instruments. And because we didn't have five saxes, if I wanted to have a four-horn uh, voicing with um, featuring saxophones, I had to slip a trombone in there or a trumpet or figure out some other way to keep, to keep hiding the fact that we were losing voices. Sure. And so that was a really good um, uh, exercise in... in um, uh, economical arranging. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, now, are you writing the whole time you're on the road? Are you coming up with new stuff? Or? No. 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 I. I was. I, I didn't have that kind of. I think I wrote probably one or two arrangements dur- during a tour on, out of all of our touring. I was not. I think part of it is that um, I like the hang. You know. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> no, I get it. So, For sure. So and and also because we were so short staffed, I was basically the road manager. Um, even though we, we had other road managers too, um, dr- who did dr- various kinds of driving and certainly helped out a lot with off state mm-hmm. stuff. But uh, I had a big managerial responsibility. So between, you know, playing, uh, drinking, and um, road managing, I didn't have that much spare brain space. Sure, for, yeah. For so arranging while I was out there. So you're doing the charts and then you go out, play them, get the stuff together, come back to Boston, write some more charts make another album, get the, get the thing yeah. rolling. We had a cycle for a while. And, and I, should, I should add that there were other people writing okay. excellent, excellent charts uh, um, in, the, in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, the, probably the two biggest contributors were Curtis Hasselbring, uh, who's a you know, great trombone player and a fantastic writer, and Bob Nesky, bass mm-hmm. player, who yeah. was with us for a couple of years, who wrote a lot of re- really nice charts for us. And we, and, uh, we continued to play both of their books both of their uh, repertoires um, long after they were out of the band. So they, they made an indelible, you know, a sort of long lasting mark on the band with their writing as well as their playing. And other people were, 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 were chipping in here and there. Sure. So th- th- this may, I think this will pertain to what you're doing, you know, in any, in any uh, era here, but what is it that compels you to write new stuff are you thinking in terms of like all right because it's a lot of i mean it's anytime you got a big band you know a larger group and you have to arrange the whole thing it's yep. a it's a lot of work getting the whole thing together is that a, is it a matter yep. of okay we want to put out another album or is it are you bursting awake in the middle of the night with dreams <laughs> of new pieces or is it is experiments or what is it that that drives drives it forward that's a, that's a that's a great question um uh i'm not one of those i'm not like ellington not, not that anybody is, but I'm not one of those people that just wakes up <laughs> dripping with ideas and just starts writing them down or, or whatever. I, I, I'm, I'm more of like a sort of, we need this, you know, okay. Like I think about our last performance, recent performances, what do we need? We need something. 
um, we need a we need another fast tune. We need we need a tune that has changes. We need we need like uh, we need a grittier tune. I I I, I sort of wrote uh, often for repertoire management, I guess. You know, like and that would that would give me a little bit of guidance about sure what. And then I would also think in the Ellingtonian way about okay, um, you know. Um, so and so hasn't had a good feature written for him for a while. So let me write something to make him sound good. Mm. You know, so I would I would write for the people, and I, I write for the people and write for what I thought we needed for the audience. And then you know, once you get rolling, then the ideas become them their own babies. You know, once once you start to get the an idea, a good idea or two out, and it it's no longer just in your head; it's on paper, or at least you know it well enough so you don't forget it. Mm-hmm. Um, then it becomes its own thing, and then you're playing. You're 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 sort of uh, playing. It's like playing with clay, or you know, it, once it's externalized, that's a whole, that's a different experience, and that's a space that I love getting into. I, it's hard to get into the into that. You me. mean the idea that once you have the concept down, then it's a matter of bringing it to life in a certain way, or arranging. Yeah, or, it or... You get, or getting to that point is the hard part. Once I have ideas, <laughs> I can sit there for like. I can sit there for days in a row and play with them and figure out how I'm going to flesh them out and how I'm going to develop them from the beginning to the end of the piece. For me, the hard thing is like feeling confident enough about the original kernel, you know, that, yeah. that, I, that I want to dive in and spend like days or longer with it. Right. Um, and it counts a lot if that kernel is strong in the first place. Cause, right. Well, that's just it. Yeah. But sometimes you don't know until the end anyway. I mean, I don't know. I've done, I don't know how many arrangements I've done for, for a nonette where I finish the thing and then I, I, we play it once. And I just throw the garbage to say, well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. I, I tried pretty good on the piano, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I've got, I've got files full of uncompleted stuff. And to my, um, to my benefit, and thank you to the guys in the band. Somewhere around '96 or '7, I stopped. I, I started bringing sketch scores to the band instead of feeling like I had to do a, a finished thing with finished parts. And this was, I was still writing parts by hand, you know, and that takes you know forever. Forever, yeah. Um, so I would bring I would bring untransposed sketch scores to the band, so where everybody's reading off of like score paper, you know, or and and the guys were indulged me enough to. You know, pick out their inner voice, the horn players, you know, you know how hard it is to read an inner voice in a, in a voicing, um, sure. and transpose it. And, and then, and then as I started shuffling parts of the arrangement, say, well, why don't we do a over here instead of D, put a D over there, put a repeat. They indulged me in a way that, you know, that, it, you know, it was amazing. Um, and I wish every composer could have that kind of indulgence from, from a band. Yeah, that skill. But so I, I got into a period where where we were reading off of untransposed scores, and then I then I you know started sort of mixing mix, and then I got into somewhere along the way I got into using finale and got pretty good with that. And that makes that takes away the whole you know parts copying thing and it's a yeah, whole different, a whole different world helps a lot. Yeah, that seems like a good format too to be able to uh, bring the music in and play it while it's in its formative form because a lot of yeah. the time you write something out and you it looks yeah. good on paper or you know what the organization is going to be but it doesn't have the same life that you might have if you were improvising or if you're making something up on the fly or if you're working with a band yeah. okay well that space is filled in by the bass player and the drummer there's things you can hear right. in in real life that you don't always get you know no doubt on paper now given that we're not all mozart um right yeah, yeah we yeah. need a little bit of a little bit of audio feedback to uh to uh to get, and and you know finale if you're depending on how you set up your workflow with finale or Sibelius or whatever you use mm-hmm. um, you can kind of do that uh, you know you can do that work that same way where you really reshuffle arrangements you know um, after you heard them um, yeah you know you have to be somewhat dedicated and you have to be organized in a way sure but but it, but it's it's doable once I realized I could do that then then I stopped torturing them with untransposed <laughs> handwritten tiny little scores with like tiny little notes the size of like you know ticks yeah you know, deer tick you know whatever <laughs> right yeah, yeah yeah good reading practice though anyway, oh god uh, you know <laughs> and you know you know what um gil evans w- did some uh, with his band i noticed he did some of the same stuff he just handed out scores and those guys mm-hmm. were doing it and so i felt like i'm not i'm not an unprecedented un- unprecedented torturer here you know it's sure it's, 
it's been done before. Uh, but um, it's nice. It's nice when you can make it easier for for people. Yeah. Now with the either orchestra, you've got a a really wide range of styles within the band, but it all seems cohesive. It isn't like oh, this is totally out of left field. Even though you might have something that's super, you know, swing. And then you might have another thing that's like a Ethiopian boogaloo or something like right, that right, or right, whatever, right. but it all seems <laughs> in the same, in the same uh, realm. Is there, is there something that you, do you think about like, okay, what's the sound of the band? How do I shape this? Or is it just like, ah, whatever I come up with is going to work and we'll have fun with it. It's more organic. It's, you know, the people in the band play the way they play. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, over the decades of the band, there have been different people that played different ways you know, especially if you go through like the drummers, you know, the, the, we've had very radically different drummers, but, mm-hmm. but, um, but it's always the same drummer sitting there for the whole night. Um, so, so that, that, you know, the, the people's personalities kind of gives it some cohesion. Um, and I think maybe I'm, I, I have, even though I love transcribing music to really see what the ins and outs are, like on a, like an insanely detailed um, level, as far as expressing music, I'm sort of like, uh, I'm not, I'm not precision. Isn't, isn't the thing that I'm going for. I'm going for a feeling when I'm writing music. And so mm-hmm. maybe my emotional, you know, or artistic uh, thing, you know, colors all the music, whether, whatever the style is, you know, it's always, it's always coming through except for the charts that I don't write, but, and, and when other people bring in charts, usually they, you know, they, um, they're steeped in the either orchestra sound. So they, they, they fit it into the universe somewhere too. And if they don't, some of them don't, don't float eventually. I mean, I always try to give sideman charts like a, a triple big chance to, um, to uh, become part of the book because I want them to keep doing it. But sure. So yeah, it's, it's, I would say it's more of just a bit uh, like an organic aesthetic. Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting. Now, how did you, how did you get into Ethiopian music? And where did uh, that, where was the beginning of that? In, um, well, I, I, I guess the first African pop music that I listened to was like Fela, mm-hmm. probably back in the late seventies, but that's pretty different bird from Ethiopian music. But I, and I always listened, I had a lot of Nonsuch Explorer series records, which was in the sixties and seventies. That was kind of like, if you were going to listen to ethnic music from around the world, that was, that was like the, one of the main sources was the none such explorer series. And I had a lot of those. Hmm. So I heard African, like, you know, uh, not, not modern pop music, but more like, uh, indigenous, you know, indigenous isn't the word, but folk music, I guess. You sure. Call it. Uh-huh. Um, so I had some grounding in Africa, but then in 89, 88, 89, my friend, Louisa Hofstadter, who was working at rounder records, was a good friend of mine great music person um gave me this Mahamud Ahmed LP mm-hmm. and it was uh called Ere Mala Mala and it was the first really well um well curated let's say and well distributed LP of Ethiopian um popular music that hit the western market it, and it came out of it came out of um uh, Belgium I think and um uh, but but I heard that record and I was like, this is interesting stuff. I, I really liked it. I didn't quite get it, mm-hmm. um, but I listened to it a bunch. And and uh, and then about three, four years later, my friend Mark Sandman from the, uh, the late leader of Morphine, the band mm-hmm. Morphine, yeah, um, who was a, a good friend. I put a, I put out their first record on my label and he lived in my house for a while. We, and we played oh, band, wow. a b- band together for many years. Uh-huh. Um, and he knew that I liked the African music. He did too. He was a big yard sailor. He would go and like go around Cambridge and try to find like the beat up old, you know, LPs of whatever. Uh, but he came back from um, France with a, a a CD called Ethiopian Groove, the Golden Seventies. You know, how can you resist that title? Yeah. <laughs> and it was a it was a compilation of really good stuff from the late sixties and early seventies, sort of the end of the highly Selassie period, mm-hmm. and um, and uh i put it in my cd player and I, I may not have taken it out of that cd player for two years i just fell in love with it yeah it was, i just thought it was great and this was who was on it do you remember yeah it was uh um well the walayas band uh uh, uh, uh um astero awoka um ayalu mesfin um um 
I can't remember everybody. There was like 16 sure. tracks and probably about a, 10 artists. Mm-hmm. And, but it was really good, really, really good. And so I just, I, I, list, I listened to it sort of for pure joy for a few years. And, um, and then in 96, the end of 96, either orchestra had been together for 10, 11 years. I gave the band like a, almost a year off, like a half a year off because uh, my son was born and I was just a little burnt. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then when I got the band back together, I, I actually uh, changed a lot of personnel, had an open audition. And the new band had only three people from before, me and, and Charlie, Cole Hayes and Tom Halter. Mm-hmm. Whole new rhythm section, new rhythm section, but, you know, Rick McLaughlin, who's still with me. And, uh-huh. Harvey Verrett, who's a great drummer from Suriname in South America. Miguel Zenon was in that edition of the band. Mm-hmm. Um, just some young, a, a younger generation of players, like a lot of people 20 years younger than me. And um, and I wanted to do new music with them. I didn't want to just open up the old book. I wanted to like write a new book. And one of the first things we did was three of these Ethiopian songs from, from um, uh, Ethiopian Groove. And uh-huh. we, we wound up playing them as a... As, a suite. They called it the Ethiopian suite. And they were all, they, they all had interesting, like a lot of African music had interesting sort of combinations of triple and duple meter meter in different kinds of layers. And we mm-hmm. took, we took that idea and we went, ran with it. And so our Ethiopian suite was this very, had these very complicated subtexts of different th- threes against twos and metric modulations and stuff, but it developed very organically. And it wound up becoming like uh, an incredible crowd favorite. We went touring, and I remember playing in in West Virginia, and people went nutty for this thing. And I was like, "Damn, they're onto some serious. They got whatever it is. I want more of it." Yeah. And um, so we were. So that was like became a strong part of our repertoire, and one of the things that really unified that new edition of the band. And then, uh, you know, a year or two later, I got an email from a man named Francis Falsetto. And um, he said, hello, hello. Um, I understand, you know, I understand you have a band, a, a large band, and you're, you're um, playing, uh, ver- you know, arrangements of Ethiopian music. I'd be very interested to hear it. And um, so I, I, you know, started corresponding with him. And then at some point he either told me or I realized he was the guy that put together, he, he was responsible for the Mahmoud Ahmed album coming out. He was the one that put together Ethiopian Groove. Oh and, wow! And so, and after that, he was the he was the Ethiopian series is his baby. That was like okay. his his continuation of. So he was the man. He was like yeah. the French connection, you know. Okay. Um, and uh, so Francis and I started corresponding, and I sent him the Ethiopian um, songs that we'd been recording, and uh, and he liked it, and you know he became. Uh, I'm try- trying to think of how we met first. I think maybe I went to France and, and like, cause I used to go to France a lot. I had friends there and wound up hanging out with him. And, and he, he, he helped me to all of this, like unreleased material that, you know, uh, or un unreleased material tapes from the, uh, from the highly Selassie theater from before the revolution, all of this great stuff. And he filled me in on the history because he had been researching it since 1983. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, uh, uh, and then, Eventually, in 2004, I guess in 2000, we put out our first record with Ethiopian music on it, Ethiopian songs. And in 2004, he got a he he was a, he he was a, one of the artistic advisors of a big festival in Addis Ababa called the Ethiopian Music Festival. Um, and he had, well titled, he, yeah, he got us invited there as the first first American band. And I think that same that same uh, edition, there was a, a band with that was like half English, you know, that was sort of a pan-European band. But we were the first American band to play there. And Mm. as far as I know, the first American big band to play in Addis Ababa after Duke Ellington in 1973. Um, There's a photo, isn't there a photo with with Mulatu Estake and and, uh, and Ellington? Yep, yep. That's that's a great, uh, that's a great photo where what happened was, um, and Mulatu, Became, told me this uh, is that you know Ellington Mulatto had lived in New York for about ten years mm-hmm. um, uh, in the in the sixties, so he was very fluent in jazz uh, and especially fluent in hanging out jazz style. Mulatto's always been a great he's a great hanger outer, uh-huh. <laughs> a great 
a great socializer and, you know, a very charming guy. Mm-hmm. And so when the Ellington band showed up, uh, he somehow convinced the promoter, I think it was the U.S. State Department tour, to get him a hotel room in the Ho- Ellington band hotel. And then he went and he started introducing himself to everybody in the band and saying, hey, I'm Mulatu, I'm, you know, I was, you know, I know so-and-so from New York, blah, 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 blah. And they were happy to have an English-speaking, very suave guy. And uh, so he took them around, took some of the members of the band, he jammed with them and so on. And he got invited up onto stage to play a song or two in the concert in, in the Hilton Hotel with the ballroom. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then when we got there in 2004, who shows up at our hotel? Mulatu. <laughs> Who and we knew his music pretty well, you know, because he he did so, you know he's such a significant figure in the invention of Ethiopian jazz and and uh, just bringing Western uh, musical ideas into Ethiopia. Mm-hmm. So there's Mulatu. All right. So he took us around, you know, hung out, you know, um, uh, came to some rehearsals um, and wound up playing with us on the on the concert, which is uh, which at the last minute before we left. Um, I convinced this uh, this uh, grad student at Tufts. I was actually a grad student at Tufts at the time. Hmm. Uh, this guy Luke Wasserman to come along and bring his recording gear, and so he came, and he recorded uh, our concert. And um, when Francis Falsetto, who was who was in Ethiopia with us, he was also hosting us around Ethi- uh, around Addis. When he heard that, I remember him with his headphones going, listening to the concert on tape, and going, "This is great! This is great!" I've got to put this out. And that was our Live in Addis album. Oh, Ethiopia, yeah, yeah. Theo Peaks number 20. Number 20. Yeah, that's an amazing record. It's, that's an amazing yeah. album. It's a real lightning in a bottle thing. We were very excited. The audience was very excited. Um, it, was a, it was a thrilling experience. I mean, I, you know, an unforget, unforgettable, um, unforgettable day, even though I had rather bad digestive issues going. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. That's a drag. We spent two days before that in, um, in Uganda. Playing, uh-huh. at the, playing a concert at the National Theater of Uganda. Wow. Which sounds grand. It's actually kind of, it was kind of run down, but, um, but it was really super fun visit where we played, uh, we played, you know, some of our music. Um, we did a clinic for Ugandan musicians and there were some pretty good Ugandan people, jazzers or had some, some jazz. And then there were these two just darling singers who, wanted to sing uh, Billie Holiday songs and sang them with these incredibly charming, you know, Ugandan accents. And uh, it was really great. I, at one point I was on stage with only Ugandan musicians during the clinic. And, and one of the singers sort of says, they were being very nice to me, of course. And she says, Is, would it be okay if we played an African standard tune now? And I was like, yeah, hell yeah. And, 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 and she, <laughs> she says, it's called In the Jungle, The Mighty Jungle. <laughs> I go, well, okay, let's play it. I know that one. Yeah. And so we played, so I'm standing on stage, like jamming with these Ugandans were playing, you know, in the jungle. Of my, I'm thinking, this is a very strange set of circumstances <laughs> that has led me to this situation. But I got sick when I was in Uganda. I got the uh, Montezuma's Revenge. And oh, wow. Yeah. I'm still dealing with it. But it, it, didn't, it didn't seem to slow down the band. Um, yeah, uh, right. Theo Peaks 20. Yeah. Are you the only non-Ethiopian band that's on that, in that series? There's some mixed bands. There's, uh, there, maybe there's one, there's, there's some French musicians on some later ones. Uh, and there's like a half Dutch, half Ethiopian band that was like Ethiopia's 15, I think. Okay. But it's, yeah. Yeah, pretty good. You know, we're, for, the only, we're the only Americans. Yeah, they're right. <laughs> uh, so, and for everybody who's listening, that's an amazing, I want to say introduction, but overview in general of Ethiopian music, which is such a unique and fascinating sound of, you know, style of music. But the Ethiopian yeah. thing really oh, yeah. encompasses a lot of, I mean, there's a ridiculous it, it, amount of material in there. Yeah, they're up to 31. 31. We, have, we have one, either, either the next or the second next of a, of, I can tell you about that in a second. Sure. But, um, but if but I would say to all of your listeners out there um, that if you want to pick one record, Francis reissued the Ethiopian Groove as Ethiopics number thirteen, I think, or twelve. If you want to start with one single record, that that that's not a bad one. It's because it's it's a really because that was his original first call before the Ethiopic series when he made Ethiop- Ethiopian Groove the Golden Seventies as an as a standalone. So that's really it's really 
an amazing collection of material. It's Ethiopian Groove. Yeah. So there's that commercial. Is that what it's titled in the in the Ethiopian series? I think so. Yeah, I think it's just called Ethiopian Groove. Yeah. And it's it's like number 12, 13 somewhere in there. Sure. Uh, now did you transcribe that music or how did you how did you learn the stuff? Was it just listening to it over and over again you sort of absorbed it? Is the the one thing about Ethiopian music that was it, when I started trying to learn more about this uh that was particularly remarkable is I feel like in western music when we want to make things sound uh let's say more colorful in a certain way we just add more notes there's like more and more notes when right. i figured when i finally realized that the sound of it really comes from the fact that there's only five notes in a scale and it's just the particular choice of notes or the intervals within the thing that really give it the color yeah it's, it's kind of a surprising realization that you know it, that's ain't it the truth i mean the history of western music uh in a way is the addition of notes right you know if you go back to the year 1000 people were singing unisons and they were singing parallel fifths and then you know the harmonies get thicker and thicker until you finally get to in the early 20th century you get to you know 12 tone music right where mm -hmm. where and where schoenberg was you know trying to come up with a system to to give equal weight to all 12 notes um, sure or even pre Schoenberg, you get Ives trying to pretend like there's two brass bands right. playing at the same time. Yeah, so you might get twelve notes, even though each of them is operating within a diatonic space. Or, and sure, then you get yeah. heavily chromatic, chromatic, you know, late Romantic music, which is usually all twelve t notes, you know, in a, in a maybe a, a more hierarchical way than Schoenberg. But all of those is about, as you say, increasingly dense harmony, and um, and and then eventually trying to escape hierarchical arrangement of notes whereas what could be more hierarchical than a, a, a pentatonic melody you know um <laughs> yeah so there is that so so that but that's the fun of for me that's been the fun of doing my own version of ethiopian music over the long time now 20 something years is is trying to figure out how to balance that pentatonic um you know power with all of these devices of western music that you know that we've come up with in uh the, you know, jazz people are the most harmonically crazy people now, in a way, even sure. more, as much as classical people. How, you know, how do you, you know, that, that game between the two of those is really, it's really, it's really a lot of the fun of that. But you're so right that there's so much power in the notes that are not played, you know, in these no, these modes that where you're, there's no, you know, there's no seventh of any kind. You know, we're so used to, you know, in, in our system, going even if you see a triad you, you, you a major triad you you like look at it in context text and you go well that's you that's a dominant really or yeah. that's a major seventh sure you know um but 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 um but it's it's also interesting to look at how the ethiopians dealt with the introduction of of um western instruments and diatonicism into that music in you know basically in the 40s 50s 60s um and how they you know how they learned to harmonize their their um, pentatonic melodies using diatonic chords, which is you know something that of course we do here in American music all the time. But it was interesting to to look at the older Ethiopian stuff and sort of see how they sort of gingerly started int int introducing one chord, uh, four chords, five chords, you know, different different chords that were that were by necessity were in, were bringing in more than the five notes of the pentatonic scale. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it pushed them toward diatonicism. Um, and, um, and how, how, um, how that works for them. Uh, you know, the, when, when you listen to Ethiopian singers, except for maybe modern people who are ho super hybrid, who have had a lot of musical experience outside of the Ethiopian tradition, that, that, that still is totally the thing that holds it together is that, that those pentatonic melodies, you know, no matter what you put around them. And I put, Plenty of weird harmonies around them working in with these great Ethiopian singers. They are that's that's the core of those songs, and um, um, it's 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 an interesting challenge uh, as a player too, you know, um, because we're so used to being free as jazz players to use all of all of our notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But to but to try to maintain to to try to use the shapes from the et from the the diet uh, pentatonic Ethiopian scales. As as tools for improvisation, that became a big 
thing for me, and I think for a lot of the other players in the either orchestra who were who were, you you, you try to find little um, uh, collections of notes, inter intervallic collections, and use those even if you shift them around chromatically. You know, I mean, you know, Anchi Haye, um, mm -hmm. because I I've heard you've you've you're writing in Anchi Haye. Anchi Haye for the rest of you is a, is is the most strange Ethiopian mode. Um, for you musicians, it's one flat two, four flat five, and natural six, and um, it's a scale that has no whole steps in it, um, which is unheard of. I've never uh, thought about that, but you're right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's there's no whole steps, which is I mean every scale, every other scale you've ever heard in history, maybe unless you're a specialist in Indian or Arabic music, has at least one whole step in it, and probably a bunch of them. Whole step, yeah. you know. Um, but, but Anchi Hoye doesn't, but it has all these interesting shapes in it. You know, it has like one flat two, four, that's something it has, you know, four, uh, flat five, six, these little, little fragments are like little pieces of DNA. And sure. so, so the fun thing for me is, and, and, and Anchi Hoye also has a diminished triad in it. It has an augmented triad in it. It has a parallel, par what we might call power chords, half a step apart. Sure. Um, so it has all of these interesting things you can play around with. And if, you know, as a jazz player, you can shift them chromatically and, you know, invert them and do all kinds of crazy stuff to them that no, that no traditional Ethiopian player would ever, would ever do. Um, uh, and to me, that's been a lot of the fun of it is, is, is using that, using the limitations, you know, pushing against the limitations there. Yeah, that's I've always said that li limitation breeds creativity. And sometimes Absolutely. to say to say, all right, well, let me see what I can do with only these parameters and still be creative really opens up a whole world that you might not have thought of otherwise. Yeah, I, I wrote when I was I, I, I happened to go to Ethiopia with the band for the first time in 2004. And I was in the middle of two years of graduate school at, at Tufts. And it, it, I was in the music department and I, I was almost everything I was composing there was fully notated chamber music. Um, had nothing to do, well, I mean, not for improvisers. I was, uh, you know, it was all, all notated for classical musicians. Mm -hmm. Was it, were you doing a degree in, in classical, in classical it, composition at Tufts? Uh, what was did, it? Well, it was a, it was a master's, it was an MA, master's of the arts, and it was in music. And I had to pick one specialty. There was ethno musicology, there was musicology, music theory, and, uh, and composition. So I took composition, but what, and I spent my time composing with chamber music but also doing a lot of African music with, um, with David Locke, who's a really great uh, Ghana specialist who teaches there. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so for my thesis, I, I'd, been, I'd been studying 20th century classical music theory with a great teacher there and, and had been, you know, like studying how Schoenberg created these pre-compositional matrices um, with, uh, with, to make his 12-tone music and all these. And I thought, maybe I can come up with some kind of like pre-compositional um, device to help me write a piece of music that's based on um, Hachi Hoye. Uh, and so I, I created these, these sort of interval matrices out of Hachi, Hachi Hoye um, with, I, just, I don't want to get too technical here, but I'm, I'm curious have, as to your, I was going to ask yeah. you about the method in terms of combining yeah, those I, concepts. I, I probably have that stuff. I could send it to you too. I, I, it, to talk, I'd be to interested talk, to see it. Sure. To yeah. talk it through would be a little, a little, probably a little boring for most people. Sure. But, but, but the point being that I came up with these systems that, that, that I had to follow um, for, it, for certain parts of the piece. I wrote, I wound up writing a string quartet for European string quartet, you know, violin, two violins, viola, cello, four movement quartet just like, uh, you know, Papa Haydn. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and each, and all four movements were based on Anchi Hoye, but constructed in different ways. Um, and, Sounds amazing. Uh, yeah, I, I, it was recorded. I, I was actually recorded by a group that included two original members of the Kronos Quartet. Um, oh, wow. I can send it to you. Where is it? Can, is it can, can... It's, it's not available to the public. And maybe I should, maybe that's, that'd be a good um, coronavirus time for me to do is to like, Flip it into shape and release it. You know, I'd be interested to hear it for sure. Yeah, it sounds fascinating. Um, it's it, it's it's pretty good. I mean, I I had never written a string quartet before. I'd written other chamber music around that time, and I was still getting my my feet wet on how to make how to make a string quartet work. Even though when I was a little kid, I played in string quartets, but you know, it's a mm -hmm. writing one. I think it's got some good stuff in it. 
but it's it's um it was a really interesting you know mental or whatever you want to call it compositional process to try to figure out how to how to milk as much as i could out of that incredible scale on chihoye sure and then the reward uh, one of the one of the many rewards from that is we got to Ethiopia and I'd been like I'd been up to my ears in Anchi Hoye, you know, for either orchestra and for this. We got there, I got to our hotel, um, and there was we we knew that Anchi Hoye was used for many songs of um, religious praise, uh, God, praise to God, and also for many wedding songs. Mm-hmm. We got to our hotel, and and you know we checked in, and then a bunch of us walked out onto the front steps, and there's a there's an Ethiopian wedding going on. The people are just getting in the car, getting ready to drive away. And people are like dancing in the street and they're like banging on the car and they're singing an Anchi Hoye melody. And I was just, it was like a mind boggling experience. (laughs) This bizarre sounding scale that sounds, you know, to, to American, to Western ears, is very dissonant and very scary. You know, you can make this, you can make terrifyingly scary music out of Anchi Hoye was yeah. being sung by wedding revelers just who you know were just out of their minds with delight you know sending off their their people off on their honeymoon so yeah. it just shows you the world operates in a lot of different directions isn't that interesting i always think yeah. that's fascinating it's 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 the same thing although it, it's exaggerated certainly with with uh the ethiopian scales but it's the same, i think the same thing playing jewish weddings where we're playing like you know some wild dark phrygian sounding thing and everybody's yeah. going nuts and throwing people up on chairs and stuff yeah, like yeah. that you know that's right it shows you a different the, culture that the rhythm r- r- rhythm trumps melody uh, for sure in, in many cases yeah but yeah pretty good now, in all this, where where did uh, Accurate Records come from? Uh, well, um, in when I had the first either orchestra uh, recording, when we this would be spring of summer of '86, I'd taken the band to to a recording studio, um, and um, and we had some live recordings too. And I was like, okay, this sounds pretty good. Um, what do I do with it? And because I was coming out of the punk era, you know, and the the DIY, excuse me, the DIY thing. Mm-hmm. And also looking at Sun Ra, my my hero, who was the king of DIY. You know, I bought I bought many many Sun Ra LPs directly from Sun Ra. Like he handed them to me. You know, <laughs> did he do script. the cover? Did he do the covers he, and everything? He, he, he did. I the, the only the one time that I actually had a conversation with him actually was about 1976, and he was or 77 somewhere in there. He was uh, playing a double solo piano gig with Paul Blay. Wow. This is like a once only, <laughs> it only happened once in history. That sounds amazing. Blay was, Blay was, was recording him for his, his label, Improvising Artists. And, um, and it was in a little teeny place called Axis in Soho in, in New York. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so, uh, it, what a, God, what a, I mean, I can't believe I was there. Um, Blaze said, actually, he issued as a record, it's called Axis. So you can actually hear that music that I heard that night. Sun Ra's thing, he wound up going to the studio and recording a solo album called St. Louis Blues, but it was that repertoire. Okay. But I, being the, the fearless little stoner that I was, I went back into, you know, and into the, the dressing room, which was like a closet, and to, to talk to Sun Ra. You know, I had to talk to Sun Ra. Sure. Or shake his hand, which, of course, you can't do now. Um, and, right, um, yeah, that's a, t- a thing of times past. <laughs> that's right. And, and so there he is sitting there in his, like, Sun Ra costume, with a, a box, you know, probably like a hundred LPs, white cover LP covers. I don't know if there was anything in them, and he's just sitting there with a magic marker, one at a time, doing like a, a scribbled artwork, taking out the other one. And I just walked in, and he didn't look at me. He was just like, just doing his thing. You know, I probably watched him do it for like ten minutes, you know, completely in awe with my little job drop. Sure. <laughs> dropping and i finally and he, said, he's in full like venus yeah. outfit oh, yeah. and everything yeah. the, the jupiter yeah the saturn jupiter yeah saturn, saturn. saturn. that's what that's it is yeah, saturn. Planet, saturn. sorry sorry my bad yeah, yeah. <laughs> get your planets <laughs> together <dude. laughs> <laughs> and uh he's doing you know the, the sun i mean there's like the guy was not there wasn't an on stage and an off stage for him and uh-huh. and uh so so i finally got the nerve to say hey that was great uh you know I love, can I, do you have any for sale? And I bought, you know, it was, he was selling it for $5. You know, I probably bought four LPs. And um, so Sun Ra, Sun Ra's sort of uh, 
grassroots approach to releasing music made an impression on me. And of course, Mingus and Max Roach had tried to do that with debut records. And then out of the loft jazz era, which is, was really a lot of big influence on me as a listener and as a young jazz aficionado, a lot of people were doing indie labels, tiny little labels in New York in the 70s, um, Indian Navigation and Akba, I think was Charles Tyler's label, which had, you know, two records on it, Joe Lee Wilson, all these, all of this heavy loft jazz people who I totally admired were putting out their own records. So when the, when the either orchestra had a tape, and I'd been in rock bands, as, as I mentioned, chasing, you know, record contracts, I was like, screw this, I'm, why, waste, why waste your time on that? Let me just put it out myself, you know? Sure. So... I, I, by then I'd been through with other bands the process of putting out, you know, vinyl before, so it wasn't that hard to do, and uh, and and you know, gathering my information, my radio information, and everything, um, I, I put in uh, self self what did it say self addressed stamped cards in 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 the records when I sent them out because this was before people were doing that, and, and I had a little questionnaire like, you know. How did, you know, about the record? How, what tracks did you play? Bother with any comments? Are there venues in your area? Is uh, this to radio people in particular? This is to radio. I, I somehow somebody stole a, a really good radio list for me, so I had a really good mailing list of radio stations that played jazz around the United States. Uh huh. And I sent out these records, these dial E for either orchestra, this wacky looking LP with, from this this with a, a picture of the Russian film director Sergei Eisenstein on the cover talking on a phone looking like this, <laughs> and, you know, and then the back, you know, the, with, with like strange versions of brilliant corners, like a free jazz versions of brilliant corners, a, a funk version of doxy and, you know, okay. just a, 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 like a, a slow drag version of a Rasan tune, mm -hmm. um, you know, plus some originals. And, and so it actually, I got it out to a lot of radio stations and a lot of them sent back these informational cards because people weren't doing that. It was a, a novelty. Sure. So I, I gathered a lot of information about radio, about just about venues around the United States, and uh, so I had so I had this database, and um, and then we made our next record, and so I had a, a leg up on it, and that record did even better. Radium, it was called, mm -hmm. um, and that one was a three format monster. It was CD, LP, and cassette. And, I actually found a copy of that in a record store. I don't even remember where it was, but <laughs> I've got I've got an original copy. A vinyl on, on vinyl, yeah. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. I have to give you a, a CD because there's there's more tracks on the CD. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a couple pretty good ones we couldn't fit on, but um, uh, so so yeah. So I had and I put that one out, and then my friend Henry Cook, who's a great um, flute player and reed player, who I met at Berkeley. Um, was he was playing in in um, at Wally's a lot with a band called the Billy Skinner Double Jazz Quartet. Billy Skinner is a trumpet player who uh, he's probably he must be in his seventies by now. Um, who in the seventies was making a mark in New York. He was playing with Jackie McLean and was and and composed a lot of songs that Jackie recorded. Actually, he was, Billy's a really good writer, even more than a player. I mean, he's mm -hmm. a, um, and if you go back to some of Jackie's seventies recordings, you can find Billy Skinner on them and his tunes. And Billy was leading this band in, uh, called the double jazz quartet that had Henry in it also had, um, the legendary Bobby Ward. I don't know if you know about Bobby Ward. That name's familiar, but I'm not sure. He's a Roxbury, you know, legend. He, he, he's younger than Alan Dawson and older than Tony Williams and was like in the, the, the the string of sort of great drummers coming out of Roxbury, he was the man, mm -hmm. and um, he was offered a chance to go on the road with Cannonball. Um, but um, the story that I heard, I don't know if it's true or not, is that Bobby, who's a little bit of a hothead back then, a little less so when I knew him later, apparently got into um, an argument with Walter Booker, Cannonball's bass player, before they even went on the road, and so he he lost the job. Oh man, that's but tough. He, really great, really original, very unusual drummer. Um, so Billy and Bobby and Henry and Salim Washington, who you may know, oh, yeah. uh -huh. was, in the, was in that band. And then a collection of bass players kind of went through who, who Bobby kept firing. And um, they made this wonderful record recording. And Henry came to me and said, what do I do with this? And I was like, shit, let's put it out. You know, I was like, I have distribution, which I got through my friend Louisa Hofstadter at Rounder. Mm -hmm. 
I have a mailing list. I know how to do it. I've, I've done a few of these things. So, so we put that one out. And then other people started coming to me and saying, hey, uh, how did you do that? And, and, and I, you know, can you give me some advice? And, and before I knew it, I was like, well, shit, why not I just put it out? So, you know, within a couple of years, I put out 10 or 12 really good albums by local jazz people. Mm-hmm. The, first, the first batch had a Notrage of Phil Scarf, um, Dominique Ede, uh, who else was in that first? Emery Davis, a really good jazz violinist who moved to Paris long ago. Um, you know, really, really good document. Jay Branford, who, who was a great um, saxophonist who's been living in New York for many years. It, I think I really helped document and get and expose to a wider public, you know, uh, the Boston jazz scene of that, that period, you know, mm-hmm. um, and it just evolved over the years. You know, I had different distribution deals and through the nineties, it was actually a real business and we could really sell a decent amount of, of um, almost anything. And we sold a lot of some things. I had the, I, I, I essentially reissued the first Modesty Martin and Wood record, uh-huh. which uh, when they were putting it out the first time self-releasing it, I was like, guys, I've got distribution. And I helped them name it, and I, you know, helped them with it. But uh-huh. it was what's the name of that record? Notes from the Underground. Yeah, that's right. In fact, yeah. in fact I named it. Is that um, right? Yeah, <laughs> a little Dostoevsky for you. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, but Billy Martin wanted to have his own label, which of course, was, and he did. He put it out, and it he didn't, but he didn't have the infrastructure. And then they got busy with the road and stuff, and then they started to take off. And a couple albums later, two or three years later. Um, when they were starting to take off, I said, hey, dudes, let me put this out for you. You'll get a better royalty rate from me than anybody. And you guys are hot now. We can sell these things. And we sold a shitload of them. And that was a really good, you know, that was a great thing. And there were some other jam bandy kind of bands that, that were touring and kind of on that circuit that sold a fair, fair number of records. And so in the, in the 90s, it was like a real business. Um, sure. And you've got a lot of really amazing artists on there. I mean, you put out a lot of great records. And yeah, if you really, look on the- yeah. yeah, an interesting kind of eclectic but super creative group. Absolutely, I, I you know I never put out anything, at least for the first first you know many many years. I never put out anything that I really didn't love. Mm-hmm. You know, I think maybe a little toward the end of the nineties. Well, I, I don't want, I, I'd want to impugn anybody. I think I think everything that I put out was really good. Some maybe some of them I didn't fall in love with later on, but the first half of the catalog, I was just madly in love with, with every record in, in some way or other. And so I think that probably gave it some kind of cohesion, co- cohesion. Um, sure. And I'm sure it's, it's, it's gotta be fulfilling to be able to use that skill set that you built up to be able to get the music out to people. It seemed like a waste for me to only put out one or two, one record every year or two when I knew how to do it. Uh, um, and, um, yeah, I, I felt proud that I was able to just project this Boston scene, which is always overlooked, you know, yeah. historically for, for, you know, obvious reasons. New York is 200 miles down the road and that's where the music business is. And that's where the, you know, that's the capital of jazz for the world. Um, but I, I was glad that I was able to get us, the either orchestra and, and a lot of Boston people get our names out around. Now, of course, toward the end of the nineties, um, as a distribution, you know, we got, it, it, the, the, it became complicated financially and business wise. And I, we, I got a big sort of pressing and distribution deal with rounder records. And then that, that collapsed and it left, I went, got left holding the bag financially for a lot of stuff that uh, I don't really want to get too detailed about. Sure. And then at the end, and then around 2001, 2000, 2001, when the internet really started picking up steam as far as music distribution goes, um, my biggest distributor, my, my you know, my ninety percent distributor, which was a huge company, went bankrupt. Wow! And and bankrupted, stiffed the music world for two hundred million dollars. I mean, Sony, was a, Sony, you know, was at the top of the list for twenty twenty million. I was further down the list, but a significant amount of money for me. So that sure. that was kind of that was kind of the beginning of the end of the record biz as an actual financially sensible thing to do. Right. Um, yeah, it definitely took a turn. Yeah, it did. <laughs> it took you a know, turn then. It's history. Yeah. You know, you can't, you, you have, I mean, if I were, people say, oh, you're such a good businessman. I go, I'm not a, I'm not a businessman at all. I'm a musician who 
happens to be smart enough to learn enough business to exist in the music world. Um, or, you know, I'm like the, 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 the one eyed, you know, man in the kingdom of the blind. Yeah. Right. You know, if, if that, I'm like the one nearsighted eyed man in the kingdom of the blind. <laughs> um, and, and the business changed. If I was a true businessman, I would have said, okay, you can't sell CDs anymore. What can you sell? And I would have started making, you know, like headphones for, for you know, for, for computers. Right. That's what a businessman does. They see where you can make money and they make money. I'm a, exactly. I'm a music person who yeah. happened to intersect with the music business there for a while. Sure. But, yeah, and we're still trying to gain our footing in terms of, okay, well, how does this work now? It's almost like you can sell more T-shirts than you can sell albums. You know, you go to places with CDs yeah. and people go, well, I don't even have a thing that plays that, you know? Oh, I'd love to, I love your music. I'd love to buy it, except that this yeah. is completely, I mean, this is a coaster as far as I'm concerned. You know? Well, you know, exactly. exactly. It's a coaster. That is exactly what it is. Um, it's a, it's just a, as soon as it's, you know, it's digital. As soon as something becomes digital on a high enough quality level, it loses its, its object value. Yeah, you know the the things. I guess the CDs that sell now, or the recorded music that sells now, are LPs that are kind of, they're like coffee table books, right? Yeah, you know, it's the object itself is is the value. The contents right. don't have the value because you can go and get those contents basically for free. Yeah, you know, it's amazing. We never would have predicted that in the in the late '90s, early 2000s, that all of a sudden the records are going to come back. I've got a huge vinyl collection. I keep going back yeah. to look through it, and everything is three bucks because I bought it in Newburyport, Massachusetts, when they were just trying to get rid of everything. You know, absolutely. And, and now I'm going to these record stores in Brooklyn, and they're trying to sell an obscure Don Cherry record for you know eighty dollars or something. I'm like, what happened? This is crazy. Yeah. Right. I know. I have a record collection full of all that stuff that I bought from the '70s through whatever. And and now, like I post a picture of it on Facebook, and and somebody will say that's really worth a lot of money now. I'm like, oh shit, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I have a retirement plan there. <laughs> yeah, and I'll tell you though, there's I, I feel both ways about the the whole digital thing because on the on the one hand, it's great that we can access all this music. Like I think about especially going yeah. back to the Ethiopian stuff or whatever or music from around right. the world. If I'm suddenly interested in you know Serbian music or in you know. Indian music yeah. or whatever, I can find it instantly and learn about right. all these different cultures and learn the music. Right. But there's also a big part of it that is like, you know, back in the day, you'd have the thing. You go, hey, listen, come to my house and we're going to listen to this. It adds Absolutely. a certain air of like, you get excited about the music that's on the thing because you're the guy who has it. You know, oh, I went to the record shop and they, I found this one Mulatu right. Estake record or something that nobody has. Yeah. Yep. It gives it a certain value that it's easy to discount now. You're, you nailed it. I mean, I remember when I first started getting into jazz and, you know, I'd get, I would save up my pennies and buy one or two records. And that those that I would listen only to those records for the next month. Yeah. You know, by the time I had enough money to buy a couple more, I knew those records inside and out. You know, I don't, that, that, that first, you know, hundred records that I bought, I, I don't, I probably still have most of them. I don't ever need to listen to them because I can just like, turn on my brain and, yeah. and, and it's, or when I listen to them, it's almost like hearing it, like hearing two, hearing it running on two different things, you know, it's like, <laughs> although it's fun to go back and with, you know, more educated ears and, and pick up on stuff that you did. But, but, right. those, but, but, but it's true. We used to drill a very few things into really deep into our heads. Now you can just sort of flirt with the entire world. Right. It's something that, that the concept of an album now is, not lost, but it's taken on a different yeah. thing. But I, it's unfortunate because yeah. I love the idea of having a full, you know, yeah. hour's worth of music that all fits together and represents a time and yeah. you know, yeah, an, yeah. an era in a band or whatever. But Absolutely. You know. It's a collection. I mean, I think that retrospectively, now that we're past the LP era, although we're in the neo-LP era and more or less past yeah, the sure. CD era, the, I think the LP was a better amount of music for for listening. You know, and... Then CDs, you're talking about. Yeah, then CDs. Listening to 20 minutes, having a little break, you know, filling up your glass, whatever, flipping over and listening to another 20 minutes. I think that's a really good, that's a really good amount of music. I think CDs. Once we had CDs and, and you could put up to 80 minutes of music, I think people tr tr put too much music on their albums, including myself. Um, <laughs> Uh, you feel obligated to fill up the format. Yeah, exactly. And especially at the beginning when CDs were so much more expensive than, than LPs, you felt like you wanted to give the people their money's worth too. 
Sure. But, but I think 20 minutes and 20 minutes is, that's a really sturdy amount of music. And when you think back to like classical music, symphonies, you know, string, you know, after it, they really settled on sort of that amount of time, somewhere around 1800, you know, the 19, for a long time, that, that seems to be a good amount of, a good amount of music to listen to. Yeah. Do you worry that we're, uh, that the public at large is losing our, um, uh, attention span that it's going to be impossible even to do 20 and 20. What, what were we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, always, yeah. I think as a jazz musician, as somebody who works yeah. in like long form improvisations yeah. or whatever, the idea that, you know, people yeah. are going to get sick of three minutes of music, then all of a sudden they're going to sit down and listen to a whole concert is a little, you know, I, I, I think you're onto something. And in fact, I've applied for a grant to write um, a corpus of music for the either orchestra that's uh, where nothing is longer than three minutes and, and 20 seconds or something. Um, because I, I, I spent a lot of time over in recent years listening to, I was teaching music history, college music history. So I was spending a lot of time listening to music from the twenties and and thirties and forties, which I always have, but I was really immersed in, in all of those short records. Yeah. And, uh, and I thought, shit, this, this would be a good discipline project to, for me as a composer and for the band, as players for the soloists to play only eight bar solos. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's one of my back burner projects right now is, is to, to, is to, to do a, a collection that would be like the lost 78s or something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. From an earlier time. And, 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 and maybe make an LP worth of, of them, you know? Sure. Like, yeah. I've been thinking about that recently. I've been writing big band charts and because I, there's so many pieces in a big band, I always feel obligated to turn everything I do into some huge epic thing. But yeah. then you go back and, but it's a ton. I'm like, what am I doing? You go back and listen to Ellington things that are like two, two minutes and 50 seconds long of just pure, beautiful music from beginning right. to end. And it all works. Right. And it's a little bookend. It's like a poem instead of being like a, you know, right. novel or something like that. And, but, and it'll take you as high as anything, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, you know that when they play that stuff live, they, they stretched it out too. Sure. Um, I, I assume a lot of it, you know, maybe not all of it, but I was certainly Especially if you're playing dances or something, you got to. Exactly. exactly. I guess it's, you know, it happened it, 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 when the LP era really became firmly ensconced in the mid fifties. And then suddenly there was like, okay, we have to fill up 40 minutes. So, so the six or seven minute song became more of the standard issue. And then Coltrane and so on blew the doors off of it. And right. they had, they had, you know, they had plenty to say to play, you know, Coltrane could play for <laughs> 20 minutes of blues and keep, keep you interested. Yeah. But, One of a small number of people who can, that's right. Off. A lot of people and, don't realize that, but yes. you know, he was unique. And, and He was unique. You know, who was another guy who could, who could really hold your interest for a really long time was Sonny Fortune. Okay. He was, if you, if you get a chance to, he, he, I heard him play live a lot and boy, he, and he didn't have, he didn't have probably as harmonically or complicated vocabulary as Coltrane. He had, it was a little, I mean, not that he didn't have, I, I don't, don't mean to put him down at all. Um, but he just had, he knew how to build and build and build and keep that intensity. And so he's, a, he's, he's a good, a good guy to listen to if you're just looking for inspiration for how to play a long solo and sure. And keep it good, but uh, uh, rest in peace. He was a real nice, nice cat too. Mm. Um, yeah, he. I mean, he's he's on some great McCoy records, and he just wow. But yeah, we all got spoiled, or we got coddled, let's say, into thinking that I can stand up there and and play for the, and keep it interesting without some of the discipline, you know. So, right. And, you know, of course, since 1980, the jazz world has become a whole different sort of. So it's sort of set of tentacles going in every direction and you can find everything from people that are really dedicated to playing really short, you know, concise solos to people who are playing five hour long pieces, you know? So, right. Yeah. Take your, take your choice. Sure. That's true. Yeah. Certainly that. So you're touring substantially less now, but you've maintained the, the DIY approach, which also may be, that may be a Boston thing too. Cause we always, that, we always yeah. understood that it was just as much of a chance you'd go see some great music in somebody's basement in yeah. Austin as it was that you'd go to a club, you know? Um, yeah. But you've been doing the, the looky, looky, the, the accurate, I don't know if you're still doing it, but the parties are well, you still actually, the, are you out of the loft? Well, yeah. Uh, I mean that that was 
that was sort of a th- thing that just grew organically over about seven or eight years where I, uh, my rehearsal space and workspace was, you know, I, I realized that if it was, bi- if it was, if I organized it better, it would be big enough to have concerts. And so I started doing that. And one thing led to another, it became like so many people's favorite venue for, for hearing music, for a music party and all that. But the landlord put the kibosh on it back in January because it was, oh. it was not quite fire code, you know, compliant. Sure. So, uh, so I'm not sure what I'm going to do next, but I really did love, as you know, from, cause you played one of the, one of the real memorable ones. Um, I loved putting on those parties, serving people food, getting people together, bringing together musicians, just creating a, 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 a space. I was yeah. going to say, you know, for, for, for that kind of thing to happen. And, um, and uh, I'm really sad that, well, first, it, first I got knocked out of business in that area. Now the whole world's knocked out of business for, for right. now. So yeah. it's, it's time to think about what that does for us. I think back to Studio Rivby. Sam Rivers yeah. left in uh, New York in the 70s, which lasted, I think, 70 to 80, more or less. Mm-hmm. I used to go there a lot. Oh, wow. And it was Sam's home. Uh, yeah. you know, he was there with, with B, his wife and their kids of various ages. And you could smell food cooking from the kitchen and there'd be rehearsals going on in the afternoon. And then at night there'd be concerts. And it was just like the greatest thing. It was like love, you know, it was like yeah. music and love and togetherness and, you know, and, um, and, and that really, really made an impression on me. There were a lot of other lofts in, in New York too, that I would go to. That was the most family that had the most family thing. And that was the only right. one. That, that was the one where it was most obvious that the proprietor was living there too. I'm sure in probably in some other cases it was it was going on too. But there, these little places I would go. I remember hearing um Arthur Blythe play a and Olu Dara play a, a concert of solos and duos in a little place called The Brook, I think. Um and somewhere in, in like downtown New York, and it was a summer night, and all the windows were open, and there was no air conditioning. And Arthur and they pl- Arthur Blythe was playing solo, and he was a revelation of a player. And there was a power outage, and he, all the all the pow- all the lights went out, all the power over downtown Manhattan went out, and. Um, you know, all of the recorded, you know, you could hear crap from the streets, all, all the recorded music, all the, everything stopped. The only thing that was left going was Arthur Blythe playing solo alto saxophone in a dark room. That's amazing. And uh, there were probably 15 people in the audience, maybe. And um, that kind of, that really made an impression on me, those, those days, those loft, those loft jazz days. And so I feel lucky that I was, I was getting close to recreating or creating a new version of that kind of experience um in my in my studio in Somerville and I'm I'm really sad that 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 I can't do it there anymore. And once we come out of the other end of this this tube, I'll have to see, you know, the world is changing. Who knows? Who knows where our heads are going to be at in a year when we can start really doing things again. Yeah, it's uh, uncertainty abounds here. We'll be interested to see. I will say though it has uh reinforced my appreciation for live performance. And something Absolutely. that I, I think I took for granted when we were able to do it. And yeah. now that I can't play with other, you can't even play a, you can't even do, put together a rehearsal or anything for the time right. being. And it's like, yeah. man, it's tough. I know. It makes you wish you were a pianist or something. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. It's, 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 uh, I, I know it's really hitting me on a, almost like a biological level. Now that I'm not sick and I'm speaking of biology, right. I, was, for, for, I, I kind of sick my way through the first month of the shutdown. So that was my main concern. Now that I'm starting to get healthy again a little bit, I'm like I'm missing just that feeling of playing music, making rhythm with people, you know, making sounds with people on this really primal level. And yeah, I know it's just going to get worse and worse. I know. Yeah. Until we figure out how to get out of this. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty wild. So that was, that was, um, those parties that I saw, that was looky looky, which is uh, your yeah. boogaloo band. Latin boogaloo band. Yeah. yeah which has been, how long you how long have you been running that? That was about that's about six or six or seven years now. I got I got pulled into the project because um, the guy who pulled it together was Chris McLaughlin, who's a bass player mm-hmm. who played back in the seventies in a, a great band called Human Sexual Response. 
Okay. He's like a legendary punk band from Boston, really great band. And, uh, but he's, he's a much wider, uh, appreciator of music. I, you know, uh, um, I mean, not to put down the human sexual response, which is a great band, but he's got many tastes. And he had this, uh, this, this tape of Boogaloo songs and he, he, he was, had some guys who were getting together to jam on them. Um, and weekly. And one day they invited me and I was like, wow, I don't know this. I knew, I know a fair amount of Latin music, but I was like, I don't know this repertoire. And, uh, and after a week or so, I was thinking, we need arrangements because we had three horn players and a bunch of percussionists, a bass player. We need some arrangements to really make this work. So I started writing charts, which is, you know, kind of like scratching, you know, it's like scratching an itch for me. Yeah. And then, and then, then I was like, shoot, these are really our pop songs with vocals. So I invited Vicente Lebron, the conga mm-hmm. player, who's been playing with either orchestra for many years and who's, you know, a master Dominican musician. Um, I, Cause I would tell him about the songs. I'd say, yo, we're working on this song and that song. He immediately starts singing them. Like he knew all these songs from when he was a teenager. Sure. So I invited Vicente and he started singing. And then we started, those of us in the band that could sing in tune, started singing, you know, choros, backup vocals. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and then we got, uh, then I started singing the English language songs, um, bringing back my, my somewhat dormant singing career. I used to sing back in my rock band days and have sung over the years. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then we added another good uh, Latin singer. And, and so it became really a, a vocal band as much as in it. I mean, of course, it's instrumental, but a lot of singing and just a delight, delightful repertoire. I feel like the Boogaloo stuff, which is 66 through 69 Puerto Rican music from New York, is just like the mother load of fun. You know, it's just, sure. just makes me, it got me through some, some rocky, you know, years in my personal life, you know, because it was so much fun. I would, I would tune back into that, that, uh, that music and it would always lift me up. Yeah. Who are, who are the, uh, if I were to check out the, the origins of that music, you're talking about 67, yeah, 69 yeah. in New York, who are the people to check out well, in that uh, world? Pete, Pete Rodriguez, um, uh, Ricardo Ray, um, Joe Cuba, who's, whose career goes from the 50s to the 80s, but he, he, he has a boogaloo period. He's, a, he's very adaptable, but Joe Cuba is worth checking out for his entire career. I, the more I listen to him, I the more amazed I am at. at I mean, he has, you know, there's major jazz, bebop influences, and all the way. So Joe Cuba, we we discovered a completely obscure figure named George Guzman, who's not part of anybody's pantheon, but who made two LPs for uh, Fania, um, and they're great. They're really ridiculous. They're great and ridiculous. Like he, his songs are are so silly. So there's Guzman. Mm. There's, uh, who, uh, uh, who else, uh, you know, there, there, there's, I can't remember who I mentioned who I didn't, but, um, it's a good, good place to start anyway. Oh, uh, there's uh, what's his name? Joe Baton, who was a Filipino American guy, uh, who was one of the early, um, uh, Bugu guys. If you, if you dig in, you can find it pretty easily. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, to wrap this up here, uh, now we might not know the answer to this because life is <laughs> totally uncertain here, but let's say we get back to normal performance. What's next for you? What are you working on? I have, I, you know, I don't have the foggiest idea to tell you the truth. Um, <laughs> might be the best time to not have any idea actually. Yeah. I, one of my projects for shutdown time is to go through um, old recordings that I have never, the either orchestra has tons of live recordings from Ethiopian tours from Europe, from all kinds of places, multi-tracks, not, not just, you know, stereo. Um, and I've never mixed them. There's hours and hours of stuff. A lot of them have technical problems because it's hard to record on the road in Ethiopia. Um, so I've been thinking that I should go through and, and, you know, get that together. Big, a big sort of job, engineering job. Um, I have other music that like my, my classical music, my string quartet that has never been released. I'm thinking, well, shoot, Maybe, maybe since you don't have, I don't have to press it into into vinyl. Maybe I should release all of this shit that I've done over the years. I I found some film soundtrack music I wrote twelve years ago that is kind of good and interesting. It was was rejected from the the film. It turned out the film director thought he was a composer and he would play stuff for me 
uh, over the phone and I, until I was like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> and okay. um, and uh, so that's kind of cool music, not like anything I've ever written. Um, so there's all that backwards looking stuff, forwards looking, I don't know. I, I'm really into Hank Williams. And oh, I, yeah? wanna, I wanna learn, I wanna memorize like a dozen Hank Williams songs. Sure. You know, singing wise. Uh-huh. And, and uh, you know, so I, I, I'm trying to set these projects for myself. Yeah. And either orchestra has two albums that are done that are in the pipeline. Oh, um, wow. One that's one that's going to be Ethiopia's number 33, I think, or 32. Oh, cool. It's called Nalbandi on the Ethiopian. Uh-huh. It's, it's music that was written in a, or arranged by um, Nurses Nalbandian, who was a who was an Armenian guy who went to Ethiopia in 1938 to teach instruments so Haile Selassie could have marching bands. Uh-huh. And uh, wound up becoming Haile Selassie's sort of favorite musician and was put in charge of music at the brand new Haile Selassie National Theater in 1956. And this guy, Nalbandian, he loved American music. He was a trained classical musician. He loved, he was Armenian from, and he had grown up in Aleppo, which is now in Syria, mm-hmm. what's, le- what's left of it. And he did a lot of ethnomusicology on um, Armenian church music. And um, he, uh, he basically was one of the people that helped modernize Ethiopian, modernize, uh, westernize Ethiopian music in the 50s because his National Theater Orchestra was a big band, plus uh-huh. singers. And uh, he wrote lots of charts for that. And um, when, when we went to, when the orchestra went to uh, Ethiopia in 2004, Nalbanian's children, who are in their 60s, I would say now, heard us play and said, a little light bulb went off over their heads. And they invited the whole band over for dinner and said, uh, you know, our father's music hasn't been played forever. And they started bringing out boxes of these old scores from the 60s. And that 50s. is amazing. And, uh, and said, you have to play this music. And I was like, OK. And it took seven years. But we went back to Ethiopia in 2011 and played a whole concert of Nalbanian's music. I had to kind of reconstruct it like um, forensically, you know, from partial scores and then recordings of different songs. And so I did transcriptions and I and score reconstructions and then added some of my own stuff, touches to try to bring it to life. And Sure. So we went back in 2011 and played there with a bunch of Ethiopian guests, including a couple of the old timers. We played in the Haile Selassie National Theater, which is now called the Ethiopian National Theater. Yeah, that's amazing. I, it was amazing. It was quite, that was another one of those like things where you had these moments of going like, how the hell did I wind up here? <laughs> and uh, I mean, it's amazing that it, just for you to be there and have them say, oh, well, here's all this. I mean, you could search your, your whole life to try to find those scores. Yeah, right. Say, oh, come over for dinner. We'll take the boxes out of the back and here right. they we'll are, you, you know. We'll get you drunk and, 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 and yeah. vulnerable and give <laughs> stuff you full of delicious food. And, and it was really interesting to look at his scores too because he was obviously a working musician who was busy, busy, busy. So the scores were like very much half finished and would have like, you know, sort of, they weren't like perfectly finished scores. They were, they, they were, and, and, and I heard from other people that he would just, he would make the musicians copy their own parts off okay. the scores and stuff. And, uh, and it was just fascinating. And, and also the way that he was dealing, he was a guy who was born in 1915, I guess, in, in, in Armenia uh, who discovered Ethiopian music at the end of the 30s and brought his own musical knowledge. And he, here's a guy navigating that that nexus of Ethiopian uh, modes and pentatonic scale, scales and singing with Western music. So it was interesting to see how somebody, how he dealt with that back then, given the materials that he was working with. It was kind of like finding my distant, you know, uncle, you know, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, right. Yeah, super fun. And so that's in the pipeline. It's supposed to come out. It's called Nalmani and the Ethiopian. It's really good, weird record. Did you record it in Ethiopia or did you record it here? It, we did record our concerts there. Some of the tracks are live from Ethiopia. Some of the some of the material, we either didn't play it well enough or there were technical problems because the power would go out in the theaters kind of regularly. Uh-huh. So we recorded... Bringing you we, back to the lofts. Yeah, right. Exactly. Of, uh... That's right. That's right. Um, and uh, since we had an electric piano, you know. <laughs> oh yeah, it's, a different, yeah, it's tough. Yeah, it's tough. But um, uh, we recorded. We did one studio session here, so probably forty percent of the album is from the studio session here, and the rest is live in Ethiopia. 
Uh, it's and then we the, and then either orchestra has an album of my music that's been sitting in the pipeline forever, as I've you know, not known what to do with it, you know, because I've watched the whole CD business collapse. But I have sure. somebody who wants to pay for me to put it out as a double LP now. Okay. So so we'll see how that. So goes. would that come out on a di- on a different label or the? How does I'd that? Probably I'd probably put it on, on accurate. Yeah, yeah, but you just have somebody paying to to put the thing out. Yeah, somebody's. I have a ba- an angel. Yeah. That helps. Yeah, yeah, that's just a technical thing, I guess. Is to, you know, do yeah. you put this out and lose money on it, or do you, you know, how do you make it work, or whatever? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, that's that's why I've delayed it for so long because I was always able to at least pay for either orchestra records with sales because we had a pretty good fan base. Mm-hmm. And this one, I, I've just as time has gone by since we recorded it, I've just I know that it's going to be just a big loss leader, and I haven't had the money to do it, and. And uh, but I think it's really good music, and it deserves a good presentation. So I've sort of come around to the double LP and download, um, you know, download card uh, um, paradigm. Sure. Maybe maybe I'll press five hundred for radio play because the radio some radio, a lot of radio stations still like uh, CDs rather for radio play. Right. Sure. Because yeah. you can make five hundred CDs now for five hundred dollars. So it's, it's you know. That's easy. Yeah, yeah. That's the least of your problems. Right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get, getting to the grocery store is your main, your main problem. Yeah, oh, nowadays. Yeah. Making nowadays, sure you got yeah. enough toilet paper or whatever's going on. Oh my on. God. People must poop a lot more than I, than I thought because. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Steve's like it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so when those, when those records come out, where do people find them? Uh, well, Website? when they do, uh, I mean, Ethiopeaks, uh, you know, I'm not sure how they're being distributed nowadays. Um, I'll certainly publicize them on my website and I'll send out to my mailing list and stuff. You know, I'll do my, I'll do my continue to do my DIY thing and who knows how people will be getting information at all by then, you know, maybe it'll be like trained, you know, rats with, 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 you know, (laughs) with flyers taped to their backs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Little necklaces with a, with a USB thing on there. Yeah. yeah, Right. (laughs) Carry the music around. Who knows? Drones. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, great. Thanks. Well, listen, okay. Rob, thanks a lot for doing this, man. Appreciate. Oh, it. thanks. Really fun conversation. Fun. I hope you yeah. can hope you can do something with it sometime. And uh, good luck, uh, you know, in uh, deep Brooklyn there. And I know you too. You too. Glad you're back on your feet and uh, okay. stay thanks. healthy out in, okay. in Massachusetts. Okay. See ya. All right. Thanks, Russ. Take care. Bye bye. All right, gang. Well, thanks for tuning in to another fun-filled, thrilling episode of Jazztopia. Big thanks to Russ Gershon for joining me this week over Jetson-style futuristic camera phone. Uh, We hope that you enjoyed the conversation and had a lot of fun. Uh, If you'd like to keep up to date with what we're doing here, you can follow the Jazztopia page on SoundCloud, or you can follow me on Facebook at facebook.com slash Music or on Instagram at at Bob Spellman. And we'll keep you up to date with what's happening. We'll be putting out a new episode every Thursday. And we're going to try to overcome the elements using the technology that we have at our disposal and try to have some more fun shows and do the thing and try to keep everybody sane in this very unusual time. All right, gang, everybody stay safe out there. Listen to some good music. Have a good time. And we'll see you next week. See you.